The outstanding female composer of the Middle Ages, there aren't very many, is by any standards uh, Hildegard uh, from Germany, Hildegard of Bingen, who died in 1179. And she is a very exceptional woman in an age of exceptional men. I mean, there are many people of outstanding talent and force in Europe at that time. But it is remarkable the way she uh, seems to have been responsible in some way that's not entirely clear. I think there are many who would object to me saying that, but I think it's not entirely clear. Responsible for a, a very large number of uh, fascinating texts in Latin, dealing with medical matters, dealing, of course, with her visions. I mean, what you think about her visions depends, of, I suppose, upon your position on a lot of other things, but she clearly, she, she clearly suffered from some form of, um, whether it's migraine, I don't think anybody really knows, but there, are, there is some somatic, some bodily cause, clearly, to a great deal of her experience. And she plays on that in her letters. I mean, she plays on the old, the ancient tradition, really, of a woman being a weak physical vessel and therefore a more powerful spiritual vessel. And she did correspond in a way that is not, not rare for an abbess, which she was. I mean, the abbesses of convents were powerful women of noble background, often of very sound education, and they were people to be reckoned with. I think everybody knew that. But she did, I think, to a remarkable level, an unusual level, correspond with people, I mean, with popes, for example, and was taken seriously. Uh, she, I mean, her writings were examined very, very carefully. The church considered that it had a serious responsibility to look at what she'd written. But women who are recorded to have sung very large works of their own composition, uh, there are more of those than just Hildegard of Bingen. The, the thing that's specifically important about Hildegard is that her material survives. In one instance, in a manuscript she supervised, um, in a notation we can decipher. I mean, this, this is material from the middle to late note, the, the 1160s, presumably, in the 70s, and it's in a notation we can decipher. And that's what makes a difference. A, it was written down, and B, it was written down in a notation that we can now read. Because not all notations of that period are now clearly legible. It depends what the scribe chose to use. So she clearly is, I think, also a most remarkable artist. Um, while it's easy to see, to hear, that there are traces in her work of the chant that she would have sung, you might say professionally, as an abbess. She has a very distinctive musical voice. There's no, I think you can tell a Hildegard chant a, a, a mile away, quite honestly. And it's one of the most remarkably idiosyncratic and powerful and eloquent voices I think I know in medieval music. The poetry is strange, as you'd expect from a visionary. It's often very uh, densely densely imagistic, and it's not, it's not imagistically coherent in the way you would now expect poetry to be. Someone once criticised Dylan Thomas, for example, because he had the line, as blunt as a flower, and someone said that doesn't make any sense because bluntness implies tactile resistance, and if you push on a flower, it doesn't resist. In other words, it do, it's not true to the sensual world. Hildegard's images aren't either. They, uh, they don't have that kind of vividness. They have a much more mystical and associative vividness. The dove peered in through the lattice window where before her face a balm exuded from radiant Maximilian. Well, there you are.